Ah, assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, my name is Farhan Yusuf and on behalf of the MHI core team, I would like to welcome all of you to our today's webinar for MHI health professionals. Uh, so for today, we decided to do a webinar on understanding the field of public health, which was basically almost a, an offshoot of the last session that we had done on the public health aspects of Corona. And we realized that there might be a lot of questions around the field of public health. And because we have quite a few experts on the group, we thought uh, it would be good to have this. So also today's session is uh, slightly different because we will have Dr. Jahangir Sharif doing a presentation, but then after that, we have invited some uh, public health practitioners from the group to be part sort of a panel to answer questions if at all uh, participants are going to have those. Uh, so keeping in mind time, allow me to introduce uh, a dear friend and someone who is very famous for his uh, sense of humor, Dr. Jahangir Sharif. Uh, I am not going to describe him in ways that I would, but I will read his profile as was submitted. So Dr. Jangi Sharif is a doctor with four years of experience in general practice. He is currently pursuing a master's degree in public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and he attained his medical degree from KCMC. I hope in his talk, he will also cover a special area that he has expertise in, which he likes to call mountain science. Uh, so, Jahangir, Karibu. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Jahangir, and we can see you as well. Thank you for switching on your webcam. Okay, thank you very much for that excellent introduction, Farhan. Um, it's not mountain science, it's mountain medicine. Mountain science is probably the science of how mountains came to be. Uh, but we'll go into that later. So uh, today's talk is on uh, public health. And um, I just want to give a brief overview on, on the field of public health. Of course, it's, it's very difficult to do justice to this uh, broad topic in uh, such a short time, but I've tried to make it as concise and uh, as interesting as, as possible for, for everyone. Because um, Mohsin Chacha, my uncle, so Mohsin Sharif and I are, are on a mission to recruit as many people as you can into the field of public health. So inshallah, this, this um, will help, you know, bring some people to the cause. So um, every time there's a major outbreak somewhere in the world, one particular field comes into the limelight, um, which is public health. It was popular during the Ebola outbreak, became largely forgotten in the middle, and now has become popular again due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so what exactly is public health? Public health, according to the WHO, is uh, defined as the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, and uh, promoting health through the organized efforts of society. Is, is my PowerPoint showing? Uh, no, it is not. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Let me just uh, share my screen. Whoops. Excellent. Now? Uh, yes, now we can see it. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Fine. So um, public health, according to the WHO, is uh, defined as the art and science of preventing disease, prolonging life, and promoting health through the organized efforts of society. Um, in other words, public health is a discipline that addresses health at a population level. This could be any subset of a population as well. You could be looking at everyone living in a certain country or city or even neighborhood or you could look at certain groups, for example, all Kodjas living in Tanzania. Now, uh, public health, global health, planetary health are some terms that have been used interchangeably. And if you ask a majority of people, they won't be able to tell you a distinct difference. However, the Lancet Planetary Health Editor-in-Chief put it quite nicely. She says, while public health is about health protection and health promotion within the health systems, and global health looks at how to improve the health of populations worldwide, planetary health broadens this discussion by looking at the societies, 
civilizations and the ecosystems on which they depend. Planetary health offers an exciting opportunity to find alternative solutions for a better and more resilient future. Now, let's talk about uh, public health in a broader context. Public health problems are diverse and can include infectious diseases, chronic diseases, emergencies, injuries, environmental health problems, as, as well as other health threats. Regardless of the topic, we take, um, we take the same approach to a public health problem by, by following four general steps. So first we ask, what is the problem? In public health, we identify the problem by using surveillance systems to monitor health events and behaviors occurring among a population. After we have identified the problem, the next question is, what is the cause of the problem? For example, are there factors that might make certain populations more susceptible to disease, such as something in the environment or certain behaviors that people are practicing? Once we have identified the risk factors related to the problem, we ask what intervention works to address the problem? We look at what has worked in the past in addressing this same problem, and if a proposed intervention makes sense with our affected population. In the last step, we ask, how can we implement the intervention? Given the resources we have and what we know about the affected population, will this work? This is a very simplified approach, and each of these steps can actually be branched out into more specific activities. But generally, these are the questions that must be answered to identify a response to a public health problem. Now, let's look at how the public health approach can be applied to a historical example of an infectious disease. This is a very famous example. It's, it's used um, in a lot of uh, public health courses. So I thought, let me just go with it. Um, so during the early 1800s in London, cholera, a fatal intestinal disease, was rampant, causing death to tens of thousands of people within hours of the first symptoms. At the time, which was before bacteria and viruses were recognized as the cause for many diseases, popular opinion held that cholera was caused by bad air coming from rotting organic matter. John Snow, a British physician during that time, had a different opinion of cholera. He believed that the illness was spreading by way of a contaminated water supply because sewage was routinely dumped into the Thames River and cesspools near town wells. Because of his work tracing the source of the cholera outbreak, he is often considered the father of mod modern epidemiology. His research changed the way we look at um, diseases. Now, let's apply the public health approach to Snow's research of the cholera outbreak. What is the problem? Snow conducted public health surveillance by looking at where those with cholera lived in London. He saw that larger clusters of the cases were occurring in specific areas. The red circle depicts the neighborhood in question and the black dots represent the deaths from cholera. Notice the higher density of deaths around Broad Street. Next, he examined the data and tried to identify risk factors. That is, he tried to determine the cause of the deaths by using the pattern of where cases were occurring. This slide illustrates the location of the water pumps, which are indicated as black boxes. On the basis of his previous work, Snow believed that water was a potential cholera source. The map reveals that the largest number of cholera cases occurred in areas near neighborhood water pumps. This observation prompted Snow to further research the distribution of water pumps in London. He identified where people who had cholera were drawing their water. His findings indicated that clusters of cholera cases were more commonly located around certain pumps, particularly the Broad Street pump. Through his research, Snow concluded that drawing water from the Broad Street pump was a primary risk factor for becoming ill with cholera. Now, using the final step of the public health, implemented the intervention by removing the handle from the Broad Street pump so no one could continue to draw water from the
cholera and other diseases, which resulted in the implementation of policies and laws for water sanitation. <coughs> now, I briefly want to talk about the wider determinants of health. We understand quite clearly the direct causes of some diseases, that is the pathogen responsible for a disease, the vector for a certain pathogen, etc. But there are other factors that are also responsible for causing illnesses. These are the social, political, and commercial determinants of health. The broad social and economic circumstances that together influence health throughout a person's life are known as, sorry, something just came up on my screen. Um, so yeah, the broad social and economic circumstances that together influence health throughout a person's life are known as the social determinants of health. There is a social gradient across many of these determinants that contribute to health with poorer individuals experiencing worse health outcomes than people who are better off. Children growing up in more deprived areas often suffer disadvantages throughout their lives, from educational attainment through to employment prospects, which in turn affect physical and mental well being. Poverty perpetuates ill health through undernourishment, lack of clean water, poor sanitation, and lack of access to basic and advanced healthcare services. These factors constitute immediate risk factors for health and have been reported as major causes of illness and mortality among poor people. <coughs> and this is also quite um, visible in Africa. While we are on the topic of social determinants of health, recent events have brought into sharp focus how racism is also a public health issue. In one of the reports published in the UK, systemic racism was mentioned as a factor for the differences in death rates between ethnic minorities and white populations. Now, the thing we have to try and understand here is that people were not more at risk of dying from COVID-19 because they were black or brown. It was because of the disparities that exist between ethnic minorities and white people. Housing conditions, job security, income, all these have an impact on a person's health. And the poorer you are, the poorer your health and thus the more susceptible you are to die from complications of COVID-19. Um, so we'll come to talk about political determinants of health now. Politics and health are inextricably linked. Many decisions taken by politicians have a direct impact on the health of a population. How a government chooses to spend on healthcare, their tax laws, the minimum wage, immigration laws, environmental law, all have an effect on people's health. Conflicts also have an effect on people's health. People living in conflict zones have poor access to health services, poor access to clean water and sanitation. So let me just go get a sip of water. Yeah? Uh, so as Jahangir gets a sip of water, just reminding everyone to feel free to share any comments or any questions that they have on the chat and we can look at those after the talk is done. Thank you. I'm clearly new at this, you know, I should have come prepared, but I'm not as famous as you make me out to be Farhan. Anyway, so now let's come to the commercial determinants of health. Uh, from this infographic, it's quite clear that a majority of the biggest brands globally are owned by a few, a few major corporations. The combined advertising budget of these companies is in the billions. It is no wonder that their products are so famous, you know, so familiar to everyone. The other big players in the commercial sphere are tobacco and alcohol, and of course, more recently, gambling. In 2018, cigarette and smokeless tobacco companies spent nearly $9 billion on advertising and promotional expenses in the United States alone. The alcohol industry spends billions of dollars on advertising as well. All these industries make products that have a direct impact on the health of populations, and it is nearly always for the worse. Public health has always faced an uphill battle with these corporations because of the power they wield over officials through lobbying and on the media through their massive budgets. Just to give you an example, 
The fifth International Congress on Physical Activity and Public Health held in Brazil in 2014 was sponsored by Coca-Cola. This was at a time when sweet and soft drinks were already recognized by independent, independent organizations as a major cause of the uncontrolled obesity pandemic. Now, <clears throat> how is public health different from clinical medicine? Because you know, in clinical medicine, you see one patient at a time, and in public health, we see um, uh, health at a population level. So let's take one example and see how clinical medicine differs from um, a public health uh, perspective of the same thing. So imagine you're a doctor and you get a patient who is a minor. By, by minor, I mean, you know, people who mind, not young kids. So a patient who is a minor who comes to you with a lung condition. You send him for an x-ray to try and figure out what's going on. The following week, you get another minor with the same condition. Normally, you would follow the same protocol. When you discover what's wrong with them, you try and treat or manage their condition. This is how we all practice as doctors. But a public health approach would be to try and figure out whether there are other minors with the same condition, see if their symptoms are the same, and try and investigate the cause of this condition. You'd conduct a study and probably arrive at the conclusion that it's the dust they inhale in the mines that's causing this condition. That's what epidemiology is all about. You would then investigate ways to intervene. And the first thing you would recommend is that minors should wear masks while at work to protect themselves from the dust. This can also result in making it mandatory on mining companies to provide protective equipment to their employees. The overall result would be preventing further cases of this lung condition in other minors. This way, we have had an impact on the health of a whole population, that is, those very same minors. Now, after giving you this whistle-stop tour through some aspects of public health, there are a few things I would like to discuss. And these things, in my personal opinion, are quite important with regards to the world of public health. Firstly, the public health sphere and academia in general has an unhealthy obsession with publications. There has been a lot that has been said about this, but I would just like to reiterate a few things. Many times when you're applying for jobs or funding um, for research, applicants are judged on the number of research papers they have published and the journal they've published in. This has led to people conducting research for the sake of publishing and not for furthering the cause of science or to make a difference in people's lives. And of course, journals are also very quick in wanting to publish the next great thing. This was glaringly obvious recently when the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine published papers that had anomalies in their data and these studies were eventually retracted. Having said that, this is a problem that will not go away soon. <coughs> Thus, I would like to make a small request to members of um, MHI. You know, those that are in the process of conducting research, you should try and involve junior members in your projects as much as possible, if you're able to. And I'm not talking about giving people a free ride, but rather involve them in the process. Explain the nuances of research to them and get them to help out in some way. This way, a junior health professional can get their name on a paper, which as we have discussed is quite important, but they can also learn about the research process. Secondly, it's not easy to take into account all the determinants of health that I mentioned earlier, especially while working in a clinical setting. We are trained to look at each patient's condition individually, but sometimes if we take a step back, there are patterns that you can recognize. For example, why are so many patients from Rombo presenting with diabetes? Why is there a certain cancer more common in a certain population? Thirdly, in order to conduct good research, good data is key. Filling in the Mtuha gave me a headache. I, I won't lie to you. But accurate data from Mtuha can help identify patterns which can then be used to channel resources effectively. It's definitely not easy. And this is a fault in the system more than anything else. Um, when I used to work at Jaffrey, we had a computerized system where you could see the number of patients waiting to see you and how long they had waited. 
Now imagine you've got 15 people waiting outside and the 15th person has waited nearly 20 minutes. So the person who's immediately coming in has waited for so much longer. All this is going on in your head, but you have to fill in details of the patient they just left in Doha. So it's difficult, I understand. Um, and different centers have different ways of dealing with this. So where I did my internship at Seliani, they had employed people to specifically do this. So they would get data from the computer and you know, fill it in into uh, some Tuha books. Finally, I want to assure anyone thinking of doing public health that public health is definitely for anyone. My class this year has been very diverse. There are doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, business consultants, and models as well. So, you know, and um, one of these models is actually doing a very interesting study for a summer project. So she's doing a qualitative study to look at the impact, the mental health impact of the modeling industry on uh, those working in it. So, yeah. And um, here, I just wanted to put this picture for a humorous take on public health. Um, so, you know, Piglet asks Pooh, but how will we know if our pandemic guidelines work? And Pooh says, the world will think we overreacted because, of course, you know, um, the measures that have been put in place to prevent the spread of corona have been taken by some to be draconian. You know, social distancing, closing down borders, wearing masks, everyone has had something to say about it. So, you know, people say that, oh, this is an overreaction, but of course, um, studies say otherwise. So again, so you know, the conversation continues um, and Piglet says, so even when we are right, everyone thinks we are wrong. And Pooh says, welcome to public health. And Piglet understood. So um, this next slide is um, on people that you can follow on Twitter for updates on, you know, public health matters. There are people from different parts of public health. You know, epidemiologists and biostatisticians are there because I feel they manage to explain epi and stats principles in very simple terms, um, which has sometimes helped me as well. But while I was going through the list, I realized that, you know, a lot of these are um, from the West. So I thought, hmm, I need to put somebody in there who will, who will balance this. And who better than our own brother Farhan Yusuf? This man himself balances the whole list of, of other people, you know? Farhan, how can we compare you to Richard Horton? Who is Richard Horton in front of you? And then um, the next thing is interesting courses on different aspects of public health. Um, these are quite interesting and I think um, quite important um, for anyone interested in, in this. And you can take this online and it's, it's all free. So, the one on understanding clinical research is quite good, um, especially for those who like to read research papers, or even if you don't like to read them, but you'd like to make sense of them. So this course um, is quite helpful. I understand I've put these in the slide, but um, I'll create a Word document and have it sent um, in the MHI group. Fine, so um, this is a short presentation. I hope um, it was interesting. I still feel I, I haven't done um, justice to the whole uh, topic of public health, but um, I, I hope you found it um, informative. And um, inshallah, if there's any questions, then um, we're here to answer them as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jangi. Just as a disclaimer, today's talk is not sponsored by me, so that uh, mentioned by Jahangir was his own creative uh, innovation. So thank you so much, Jahangir. And definitely public health is such a broad topic that I don't think we can, you know, e effectively exhaust it at any point of time. But, you know, we have like half an hour for questions. So hopefully that will allow us to uh, dive a bit uh, more into that. Uh, so moving on to sort of the second phase of, of today's uh, webinar, what we decided to do is that aside from the speaker and personally the reason why I know we thought of it this way is because I wanted to or we wanted to show that public health is so broad so we have asked a few public health professionals to be present to talk a little bit about what they do as far as public health is concerned and then also answer a few questions uh, that we have prepared but also the ones from the public as well 
Uh, so first of all, I'll ask those people to introduce themselves, starting off with Dr. Mohsin Sharif. If you can please just briefly talk about what you do in the in the space of public health. Uh, alaikum. Uh, I think my introduction was already made a uh, few weeks ago when when I had my uh, talk, but uh, interestingly, uh, public health has been the core of what I have done since uh, a very long time, even before I became a doctor. But uh, uh, lately, uh, my job with UNICEF Somalia office has been uh, exciting and an example that we can give uh, of one of the elements of public health. So there are several elements uh, of public health, and as I had uh, mentioned in my talk, that there seem to be more subspecialities in public health rather than clinical medicine. So I had gone into monitoring and evaluation of uh, health services in Somalia. Uh, and uh, through that, other than the day-to-day -day monitoring of different health uh, parameters in the population and pushing it to policy makers and, and strategists uh, in the ministries of health and UN, uh, we had revamped uh, the whole system of monitoring health. So just like in Tanzania, uh, we have um, Tuha that Jahangir alluded to, there was a similar system in paper-based system in Somalia. So we had to revamp the whole paper-based system and make it electronic on the DHIS2 format. Uh, and, and that's still being used currently. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think other than that, there's a lot, but I won't take up much of your time. Uh, thank you, Dr. Musin. And like I said, we'll have questions and we can uh, elaborate further on some of these things. Next, I'll go to Sarah Somji. Sarah, if you can introduce yourself and tell us what you do in the space of public health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. everyone. Um, so just a brief um, introduction. I have done my bachelor's in biomedical science and my master's in public health. And um, I've been working um back home in in dar here obviously um in the field where i'm a study coordinator of clinical trials so we have we've run two successful clinical trials and we're currently running an observational study and we expect to start up another um, clinical trial so there's a whole team that works um in this where we have uh, people who are directly on the field recruiting um, people. And then we have a whole office at the university. And I'm um, one of those where we, um, one, we will read the protocol and then put it in our, in our context, um, in, the, in the Tanzanian context, because most of these research are international research. So they're being done in several other countries as well. So we make it context specific. And then we accordingly make the procedures. So the SOPs, um, the, um, the manuals as well, IRB um, communication, um, all the submissions, all of that. And then also the management of the field operations um, in terms of data collection and um, how to go about that so that we're not messing about with the science, but we're still um, carrying out the data collection properly. In addition to that, um, we once we're done with the clinical trial, we, we give our inputs during the data analysis phase and then um, work our way towards um, developing in, in writing papers. And, and hopefully, we haven't got to that bit yet, hopefully managing to get it to the policy level and changing the policy accordingly. So um, as I think everyone mentioned, it's a very, it's a vast area and um, everyone can have their specialty and be um, very much consumed within their area of work and mine has been very much focused in research. Okay, thank you so much for that, Sarah. And uh, 
Next, we have Sumaya Tower. Sumaya, if you can please introduce yourself and tell us what you do in the space of public health. Okay, Islam alaikum everybody. Um, so I have a background similar to Sarah's. I've got a biomedical science background with uh, a master's in public health. And I've been working for a Swiss NGO in Tanzania for the past three and a half years um, in the malaria surveillance field. So my field is very specific to malaria surveillance. And I've been working as a monitoring and evaluation officer. And uh, the area of my work is mainly um, focused on the use of data for decision making. And uh, you know, providing technical support to the National Malaria Control Program of the Ministry of Health. And currently I've been supporting uh, in terms of like changing the malaria control strategies in the country by using data for um, stratifying the malaria burden in the country and changing the strategy from a one size fit all to a more targeted approach for more better resource allocation strategies. So yeah, my, my field has very much been um, involved in this with uh, also um, some field work involved as well by, by providing more supportive roles to the district medical officers, enhancing data usage at that level for decision making and then also malaria service data quality assessments at the facilities as well. So it's, it's quite broad, I think, the field. And it's very important to know where your research area or where your interest lies, because it's a very broad um, area. And it's important to explore where your um, interest lies and then um, fine tune to that area. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sumaya. So, well, number four on the panel is myself, Farhan Yusuf. So I'm a pharmacist. I uh, have been working in the NGO public health space over the last seven years. So interestingly, I'm, I'm, I still have a bachelor's. I haven't done my master's in public health, but I've sort of, sort of been baptized by fire, having working in that field for the last seven years. And my area with that I more focus more on is pharmaceutical supply chain. So again, just to show people that there's really a broad range of specialties or areas or uh, subject matters within public health. Of course, we have other people on the group that I'd like to mention that I had even reached out to, but realizing time and we may not have everyone as a panelist, but I think just to share for people's information, we have brother Shabir Lalji, who's also more in the space of monitoring and evaluation, similar to Sumaya, and he works with malaria as well. We have Sister Shaista Hassam, who is also, uh, she has done her MPH in Muimbili, and she now works for an organization, I believe, that deals with a project on nutrition. Uh, we also have Dr. Sajad Fazal, who's done his MPH, and he works in a very interesting area that's to do more with health information and misinformation. So just again, to show the variety and for those younger health professionals who are looking at going into public health, these are sort of people that you can reach out to and ask your questions even beyond today's panel. So I will now go to some questions that I have received here and then we can open it up to the floor. So the first question that I have, and I think because Jahangir talked about this, but I think the person maybe joined in late and didn't hear about it. I'll now ask this question to Dr. Mosin, also because I know Dr. Mosin might leave us slightly sooner because of another commitment. So I'd love to hear from him. Doctor, there's a question here that says, what is the difference between public health and population health? Uh, th thank you very much uh, for that question and others on the panel can also chip in. Uh, I feel very proud to be here with those uh, uh, of you who have also been interested in public health and taken that uh, as a career and, and uh, specifically in monitoring and evaluation. Uh, Sarah seems to be in the same position I was in as coordinator of clinical trials research in Moimbili with the MOOCs Harvard uh, project. Uh, and that was the beginning of my official public health career. So population health and, and uh, uh, public health, public health as uh, Jahangir had uh, aptly explained, 
is really a multi-sectoral approach to, to uh, population health. When we talk of uh, population health that comes within the domain of public health also, but people go into it more uh, specifically for uh, the number crunching bits, biostatistics, uh, and, and so on, demographics, um, and, and very much uh, academic kind of uh, an approach uh, to, towards uh, uh, understanding health of, of communities and, and populations. So there is an overlap in population health, uh, demographic health, uh, public health. Uh, just recently, uh, I have been reading again uh, a book with a very interesting uh, name, and I thought I should mention that because Jahangir mentioned that one of his class fellows is is a model. Uh, the author of this uh, book was a journalist uh, running around the world uh, writing up reports. Uh, but then discovered uh, demographic health. So went into uh, more details of that uh, and became like an epidemiology expert on HIV. So she, after she finished with that work on HIV, she, she wrote a book uh, uh, by the name of Wisdom of the Horse because her HIV work really took her into uh, the sub-communities, uh, sub-populations of uh, prostitutes, of uh, injection drug users, uh, gay people, uh, brothels, and so on. So, and what she learned, all of that was a really epidemiology, and she wrote this book, uh, Wisdom of the Horse. So I thought in addition to answering the question, I should uh, mention that very interesting. So if somebody wants to read a really uh, uh, learn about epidemiology in a very uh, practical but juicy manner, please read up that book. Uh, you can download it for free on PDF Drive. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anybody you. else wants to chip in and, and uh, elaborate further on the way I have defined it? Mm, I, I, I see no one, Dr. Mosin. So, so thank you for that and i hope the person who asked the question has has found it clarified if not please do send me a message as you have ajangir i'll come back to you and i see there's a question here that i've received and i think also this maybe you touched on it or maybe because i think i missed it as well so you spoke of global health you spoke of public health you spoke of planetary health but then there's another concept that's coming up right now that's called one health so what is that all about? How different is it from these other healths? Jangir, are you there? Sorry, I just, uh, I was looking for the unmute thing. I don't know how it got lost. Um, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, and the thing that differentiates one health from all the other uh, you know health that you mentioned so like public health global health is that um, this specifically mentions that um, it's looking into the health of animals as well and so you know it's it's at the intersection of the health of people animals and the environment and how they come together to to you know affect everyone. So I think the difference between One Health and all the other, others is that One Health specifically mentions that it, you know, it in, includes um, animals as well, but that's, that's the short uh, of it. I don't know if somebody else can explain in further detail. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, Jahangir, and One Health is something that personally I'm also very interested in, and I guess because most of our pandemics and all of these diseases seem to be zoonotic in nature, I guess it, it makes sense to just start taking them a bit more seriously as well. So does anyone else want to add anything on that? I think it was, it was quite uh, clear. Okay, if not, 
there's another question here and I'll think I'll give this to Sumaya because she's all she's been in the NGO sector and it's a question to do with funding. So I think she might be able to shed some light on that. Sumaya, the question is research depends on funding and if that runs out, what can a public health professional do? Yeah, I think uh, funding has been a real issue, I think, um, especially in the NGO sector. You know, one of the issues that's been a constant ongoing debate is like the sustainability of NGOs in countries. And, uh, you know, you have all these NGOs coming in, their projects run for five years. They invest a lot of time in these projects and then it's time for them to leave and, you know, and then everything just stops. And I think that's been a real issue, especially like in the field of malaria, especially like, you know, there's been just, it's been a very dynamic process. Like once this NGO funding finishes, they try and hand it over to another organization and, you know, then you just lose that um, constantness and, you know, to um, continue with the project at the same quality as it used to run. And I think um, it's very important that at the same time as NGOs are, you know, investing their money into the, into the countries, there should be an investment in capacity building as well within the country um, so that even local NGOs can take up um, some of these uh, um, roles rather than always relying on international NGOs. But I agree in the research field, um, I think it's been, uh, you know, the whole research industry um, really focuses on applying for grants and, um, you know, trying to secure grants just to um, continue with the projects. So this is an ongoing thing and I'm not sure what the long-term solution can be, but I think trying to build a more sustainable approach and trying to build in and within country capacity rather than always um, relying on international assistance. I don't know if anyone else in the NGO sector has more to contribute. Mm, thank you for that, Sumaya. So I, I do have, Sarah, do you want to add something to this? Because I know, of course, the Muimbili research also relies from what I understand on external funding quite a bit. Do you have anything to share from your experience about this? Um, my only one line solution would be look for more funding. <laughs> but I think Sumaya has covered it all. It's, it's always been an issue. It's always on everyone's head. And um, I think that's one of the main concerns for any public health expert. But bottom line is look for more funding. Okay. Thank you for that, Sarah. So I think just to add on that, maybe a, a few, in my opinion, tips about how one can find funding, right? And I think, uh, so there are two things that I personally like to talk about a lot. And one is a partnerships. So I think even globally in the whole NGO development sector, as we call it, there's a big push for, you know, partnerships, partnerships, even for the big donor organizations like USAID. Back in the day when they would give projects to a single organization. Now what they're looking for is what they like to call consortium. So it's basically a lot of different organizations coming together and working on something. So there's a huge push on, on partnerships that's there. So even as an individual public health professional, maybe try to do what we call like a stakeholder mapping and try to figure out who else is working in the same area as you and then see how you can partner and attach yourself. And I think the other thing that I often uh, advocate about is just keeping an eye on the pulse, right? Which basically means that uh, the health is a huge topic. There's so much going on in health uh, generally. I mean, you know, we know how big it is as health professionals. However, uh, if you look at, so for example, whether it's the WHO or whether it's uh, other organizations, there's always something that they're more keen about. So for example, right now there are topics such as universal health coverage that are huge. There are topics such as pandemics and preparedness that are huge. So in order to sort of put yourself in a secure position, always try to see how you can link whatever research you're doing to some of these agendas that are already there because the bigger the agenda, the more support it has, the more funding it has, the more expertise it has. So just those are like two tips on my side. And thirdly is also, I think in public health, and this is something that I'm learning this year myself as well, there's a huge element of advocacy. So don't just you know think of a scientific topic and think that you are going to gain support for it. 
there's an element, and I recently had a discussion about that with Sarah as well, that there's an element of you pushing your agenda and, you know, push or advocating for what you are trying to talk about. I know Sumaya mentioned malaria, for example, is a topic that's losing funding, but there's a lot of advocacy work that's happening right now to bring it back into the agenda. So, you know, let's not forget malaria. How do we resource mobilize for it and things like that? So I think those three are, are sort of uh, tips from my end on how to, uh, you know, get more support if required. Uh, the next question is, uh, and I'll, I think I'll give this to Dr. Mosin again, that there were several conspiracy theories which circulated during the COVID-19 pandemic, including it being a bioweapon, population control, etc. And of course, these are still ongoing. What's the public health experts general take on this? And I know we have had a previous talk with Dr. Sajad Fazal. So maybe that's also a resource that people can look into it there on our YouTube channel. So that's something that people can refer to. But just for the sake of this talk, Dr. Mosin, your take on this? Yes, uh, definitely that talk uh, by Sajad Fazal was excellent. And, and I would refer uh, anybody interested uh, in, in uh, this topic to, to refer to that, to listen uh, to that keenly. And he had covered it uh, quite nicely. Uh, but just to, to summarize, uh, all social media and all these talks about conspiracy theories uh, and things which don't have any uh, evidence uh, to it, uh, and it has spread around uh, uh, societies, communities, uh, nations, and globally. Uh, it, it, it's really causing a lot of havoc and uh, uh, disturbance in the health systems as well as uh, uh, detrimental to health of the people. And just within the uh, COVID uh, epidemic, pandemic that we are currently going through, uh, there is evidence of that in, for coming from different uh, uh, countries. And that is why a lot of effort is being made uh, and a lot of money has recently been put into combating these kinds of false uh, information, the misinformation and disinformation that has been going around simply because it is detrimental to health of the people and populations. Thank you. Does anyone else want to add anything on this? I know Jahangir, you spoke something about, you know, uh, faulty research, for example, do you want to say something about this as well? Um, so again, like um, uh, earlier mentioned, this is a conspiracy theory and in health, it's on evidence. And so far there has been no evidence to prove any of these claims are true. So in short, you know, we, we can't put any weight on them. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. So I, I see another question here and I'll, I'll give this to Sumaya. Uh, and the question is more around, so, and, and of course others can chip in, but I'll just give it to Sumaya first in terms of like, so studying opportunities for, you know, MPH. I, I think the person is trying to ask like, the question of you know local versus international but then also like what are the opportunities like in terms of studying are the courses widely available what about beyond your mph are there opportunities to study more and like super specialize and things like that so just your your comment on that yeah i mean i think uh, there is a lot of opportunities um in terms of your options to where you want to study mph because it's so widely available and it's not just, um, you know, that you have to go abroad and study. There's so many online options available these days, too. And uh, these days, I mean, be before during our time, I think uh, um, public health was just available as a postgraduate um, degree. But I see now undergraduate degrees have also started opening up for global health and public health. So it's a real specialization. Um, so yeah, I mean, in terms of opportunities to where you want to study, it all depends on where you want to go. But uh, 
definitely. There's been a lot of opportunities just even locally um, with the Open University. There have been so many, I know um, quite a few students who are using that as a platform to, you know, gain their um, studies through the, for, for the MPH and also using affiliations with uh, Mohimbili or there's the, um, with Kenya as well, the Kemri Institute, um, the Nimri Institute, and trying to do their PhD through these institutes, but then at the same time, uh, having collaboration with international institutes. At the t at the, uh, um, currently, there are quite a uh, few um, collaboration opportunities, especially like Ifakara and Swiss Institute. There's a very heavy um, collaboration and lots of you know students um, pursuing their um, master's degree and PhD degrees through these institutes and the collaboration that's currently available. Um, yeah, so even for specialization, um, it depends on what you are interested in. I think I would really encourage people like after doing their masters to sort of explore the areas of interest before um, pursuing a super specialization because public health is so broad. Um, it, you can get lost in it and um, it's nice to have some sort of experience and get a feel of what you really, really are interested. But in terms of super specialization, um, it depends whether you're interested in more academia type of roles or more in the industry sector and then accordingly build your way up. But yes, it's a very diverse and it depends on what field you would be interested in, like health promotion, or are you more in the field or epidemiological side or the analytical aspects or modeling side. So it's very vast and I think it depends on where you, your key interest lies. Okay. Thank you for that, Sumaya. So for, you know, the person who asked this question, I guess, like I said, we have people on the group such as Shaista Hassam, who studied, you know, her MPH locally at Muimbili. So she is someone who can probably give an insight on what her experience was. Uh, Jahangir, do you want to talk a little bit about how your experience has been where you are right now? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so... Um, I was actually going to talk about this in the in the presentation, but then um, things that people would find interesting. But um, the experience has been quite good, you know. Uh, like everyone said initially, public health is quite broad, and there were more than forty, I think, forty-five modules. Like we had to make a choice from forty-five modules at the school. So, you know, they cover everything from um, advanced epi to uh, statistical modeling and epidemiology, WASH programs, um, advanced health promotion. So, you know, the, the modules that I went with were healthcare evaluation, reviewing the literature because I knew I wanted to do a literature review for my summer project. So I took the literature review module and then I took epidemiology of non-communicable diseases. Um, the thing that, that I enjoyed the most, I think, because, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, free courses. One of the biggest things I enjoyed um, during the course was the interactions that I had with, uh, with my fellow classmates, because that is something that, that you just cannot replace. You know, I, I met people from all over the world who have done so many different things and you know sitting with them in the seminars for the different lectures and listening to their viewpoints um that is one thing i feel that that makes a face-to-face -face, uh uh program much more better than well of course with online programs now because after corona started and the school was closed we had all our sessions online but uh, but still it, it just wasn't the same because you know people aren't that forthcoming um, um on Zoom or, you know, we used to use a software called Blackboard. But um, the other thing is, uh, well, I speak from my experience at, you know, KSMC and the Tanzanian system in general, we're, we're very focused on cramming information and then, you know, just um, writing down whatever we have crammed. And, you know, that was, that was easy for us. But here, uh, one thing I realized was that you know critical thinking is is very important and and I learned it the hard way in the in the first few weeks because you know you would just um, swallow health economics concepts and then you'd feel that oh okay in the 
in the seminar, I'll just, you know, tell them what is the meaning of the demand curve, what's the supply curve, but that's not how it works. So, you know, they would give you practical examples where you would have to make use of the demand curve or the supply curve. Um, so definitely, you know, we, we, need, we need to broaden our, at, at least I had to broaden my way of thinking. But um, Alhamdulillah, the experience has been, has been quite good. And uh, like the others said, it's not necessary to, to go abroad for, um, for a degree like this because so many of these options are available online. And um, just to give an example, because of Corona, the first um, semester at LSHTM for the coming year is going to be online as well. Um, and of course they have distance learning options, but those are also quite expensive and you know, not um, affordable for everyone. I, I have been very privileged and lucky to have had this opportunity, which, which I recognize not everyone has or can get. But um, I'm very happy to, to answer any other questions people might have. You know, you can even write to me privately regarding the different modules or, you know, methods of study and all these other things. And, and I'm very happy to, to answer those questions. One thing I've come to realize from, from this group specifically is that you know we have people from all different specialties and one thing that stands out is that people are very forthcoming with help you could go to anyone in the group and you know ask them something and and they would they would always help you out so yeah i want to pay that forward as well so if, you know if anyone has any questions regarding the degree or you know the different modules i'm i'm more than happy to answer those questions even in private that that's okay with me okay Thank you for that, Jangi. So, Dr. Musin, I know you are leaving us at nine o'clock. So, quickly, a question for you, and then we can excuse you. Uh, and so, the question is: What is the implication of public health on our community, and what is the role of leaders? <laughs> this should be the topic for for a whole hour's uh, talk. So, so uh, public health. Uh, is not just about statistics and epidemiology and monitoring and, and evaluation. It's, it's actually uh, understanding the dynamics within the communities that impact on, on health and uh, formulating strategies, uh, policies uh, regarding that. Uh, because uh, that aspect of leadership uh, management uh, strategies uh, and uh, especially the role of politics which has been recently recognized and that's why these new uh, healths have come in like planetary health uh, where politics is also very much involved uh, definitely in our communities all these different sectors should come together uh, so it's not just our medical team, but also our education people, our social welfare uh, people, uh, our marriage uh, uh, committees, uh, and 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 all others. That why I mention marriage because if even if you search online marriage and health, there are tens of thousands. Of papers that you will you will find on that, uh, and, and that's a very good topic, uh, Farhan, to to arrange for for another day. Uh, marriage and health, you know, similarly determinants of poverty and health. So our communities also they, there is that kind of disparity in terms of wealth and incomes, uh, uh, different education levels. Uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, different behaviors and interests and so on. So uh, leaders and management of our communities should understand all that and come up with strategies whereby there is equitable uh, access to good health services, prevention and, and promotion so that eventually we have a healthy community. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Mosin. And yeah, like I said, I think I understand you might have to leave us. So thank you so much for being a part of the panel. Inshallah, we'll 
definitely keep in touch. So I know we have almost reaching time. I have two more questions that I'll uh, answer and then we can close inshallah. So Sa, there's one question here that talks of, uh, because you are working for Muindili, which is you know technically a local organization, uh, what's the experience like? Because I think whenever people think public health, they're thinking international organizations, WHO, UN, but what's the experience like working for a local organization? Um, so I would say first, first of all, we collaborate very closely with international, with an international institution. Um, so we work very closely with Harvard. So um, we have that international component, but, um, and so the reason why I'm clarifying it is because um, having an international collaboration has its perks. However, also working locally has its perks. So the first point I'd like to make is everyone who has studied at Muhas or has any association with Muhas um, knows that um, it's an amazing institution and, and I would have, um, I, it would be wrong for me to say anything um, wrong about Mwimbili. However, in terms of government institutions locally, we all know that it, it, the, some of the systems are not the best of systems. So sometimes the, the smallest of issues can be um, the hardest, um, which, which are unimaginable, can take unnecessary time of your research or your science bit of, of running a project. Um, however, it has amazing um, benefits as well in the sense that um, you have the boost and support of a, of a very, um, uh, very strong institution. So being under a university has given us benefits in terms of if you have anything to do, you have, you have the umbrella of uh, the Mwimbili body. And so you have um, a lot of power when you're talking or, or trying to push a policy um, subject because then it comes under under the institution directly. Um, but as I mentioned, it, it sometimes it's very small things that um, can tick you up and, and can be difficult, but um, I'm sure most of, I know most of you are local, so I'm sure you all have experienced um, something or the other living in, in such a country. So I wouldn't say there's something that would put you off. I'm just saying that there is some, um, obstacles that you can overcome um, but just to be aware that maybe those are the things that are different from working directly under an international organization um, having said that um, having that boost from an international organization makes us as that research component um, a bit more systematic so it's good in the sense that you feel that there is a little more order and system within your system itself so within your um, research um, field However, you, it's, it's not possible to push that beyond yourselves. And sometimes making that system within your research becomes trickier because that's the requirement for yourself, but it doesn't work for that, that, that um, local institution broadly. Okay, thank you so much for that, Sarah. And I guess what I'll just add on to that quickly is that, like I said, it's all about partnerships, partnerships, partnerships in this area of public health, I think partnerships are key so whether you're working for and if you're working for an international organization you'll probably have to partner with a local one if you're working for a local organization you'll probably have to partner with an international one so that's just how uh, things work uh, last question is the one from Shania Bas and I'll, I'll start talking about that and then I guess the other people working in, in, in the NGO field can comment so considering that projects in the NGO field are time and funding limited would you say employment in the field is somewhere unreliable in the long term and you can expect multiple job changes and playing various different roles over your career timeline? So I think my take on this, my direct one will be yes. I always tell people that because uh, over years I've received a lot of, you know, queries from people about the NGO world. So I think one thing before I even answer your question, Shania Bas, I'll say is I feel like, and that was the reason behind doing this webinar, a lot of youngsters don't really understand what that space looks like because we don't have too many of our community members, for example, within that space. So everyone, when they think of development or when they think of uh, public health, they think, like I said, WHO, UN, and they think of huge salaries and they think of, so I, I get a lot of questions like that from different individuals. What I'll say is, uh, do your research, find out their local organizations, their international organizations, even within international organizations, they are 
people that we call donor agencies. There are implementing partners who actually implement projects. So there's a lot of nuances that you need to be aware of if you plan to enter this space. It's not confusing once you get into it, but you need to ask enough questions and don't just assume that, you know, every NGO is a UN or a WHO. So, so just that as a disclaimer. Uh, with regards to your question, Shania Bas, again, whenever I get these queries, I always tell people that the, and, and I don't know how academia works, so maybe Sarah can talk about how Mumbili works and, but, and what I have seen in the organization world, especially in the implementing organizations world is that you're on a contract. So I always tell people you go to work with your heart on your sleeve, with your, you know, any day you can be told that funding has either been cut or has finished or has been moved around. So what happens usually, however, is that uh, if you're working with a particular organization, most of the organizations are implementing multiple projects. So if you're someone who they consider valuable, they'll find some way to keep you on board, maybe put you on another project or, so there's always things like that depending on your performance. Uh, but yeah, so I always tell people that job security is not something, if you're looking for a permanent job, one that won't, although I always say that's quite relative even in the private sector, but fair enough, uh, job security is not something that you would want to expect from this space because a lot of it is contractual. Uh, many of the organizations have one year contracts and then every year it gets removed contingent to funding. So, so there's elements like that. So you really have to be ready to be adaptable. And that relates to your other, the other part of your question that playing various different roles. So yes, I mean, I think if you're, the uh, aim is to, you know, treat patients and, you know, be a clinician, then you should stay because in the NGO world, there's so many different areas. It really depends on how open you are to learning, to changing. Like I have in my, you know, last seven years live in this particular sector, I've done technical work, I've done HR work, I have done IT work, I have done within technical, I have done pure pharmacy, I've done monitoring and evaluation, I've done what we call knowledge management. So there's so many different areas that really I think being uh, adaptable, being uh, open to learning and changing would help you a lot. Also to help you meander through some of these challenges such as, because sometimes what happens is funding is cut, your role suddenly disappears, but if you are willing to adapt, you can easily flow into, into another role. So that's what I'll say about it. I don't know, Stumaya, do you have anything to add to that? I think uh, uh, just to reiterate what you just said, and it's true that, you know, with the whole funding and, you know, contract, uh, contract basis, um, you're likely to have to move roles or, you know, be moved from one project to another. But the thing about public health is, is also about skill transfer. You gain some skills and it can be transferred and applied in different areas, I think. And the key is equipping yourself with the skills and then you can apply it in any, um, you know, field with health promotion or another field like monitoring, evaluation and surveillance. This is something, you know, um, once you gain the skills, you could apply that into any field like malaria, HIV or health promotion or anything. So I think it's the key is about the skill transfers as well in public health. Okay. So thank you so much for that, Sumaya. We've gone eight minutes over and I don't see any other questions also. So all I'll say is thank you so much to everyone who attended and especially to the panelists. I was told by someone in the comments that I should commend the fact that we have such young panelists and you know young people working in this space of public health and of course to encourage more youngsters from our community uh, to join the field and you know to ask questions and to connect uh, so thank you everyone for joining thank you panelists for your time uh, this has been recorded and should be available on our MHI YouTube channel in a short while we'll keep you guys updated and yeah we'll see you in our in our next session and of course thank you Jangir for being our keynote presenter
you're welcome. Thank you, Germany. Have a have a good night. <laughs>